Okay, so now moving on to chapter four. Chapter four starts a section where the Hebrew word riv, or judicial case, is used. The bar, coming before the bar. And um, basically God says, I'm going to be doing a judgment against you because of your sins. Now, for us, maybe we have a traffic violation, and, and maybe if we're going to argue it, we might come before a judge. Or, God forbid, maybe someone uh, robs us, uh, extorts us, and we have to go to court. But we try to stand of court as much as possible. And uh, the concept of a court here, we have to wrap our understanding around what God is saying here in Hosea chapter 4 and chapter 5. He's saying, I am not only God the creator, but I am God the lawgiver. There's an incredible passage in Isaiah talking about the end of days where it says, Ki Adonai malkenu, Adonai shoftenu, Adonai mechokkenu, hu yoshienu. So what that means in English, for the benefit of those who don't understand Turkish, is it says, because God is our king, God is our judge, God is our lawgiver, it was he who will save us. So God is not only the creator and the giver of the laws, he's the, uh, how would you say it, he's not only the uh, um, legal authority, he's also the judicial authority. And his judgment is the executive authority. He's all three of them together. And so in Hosea 4, he comes to the Jewish people and says, let's talk some legal issues here. And uh, he says, Yahweh has a case against the inhabitants of the land in chapter 4, verse 1, because there is no emet. Emet is where we get the word amen from in Hebrew and refers to something which is dependable or unshakable. So when you're saying amen, you're saying may whatever has been prayed, may it be coming to pass, may it be unshakable. The same word is used for an artist that you can depend on his work. He does a, a ring made of gold and precious stones. It's dependable. He didn't cheat on the amount of uh, metal and the, the quality of the stone. When you have a nursemaid who takes care of your children, she's an omenet. She's dependable. The word for pillar is probably connected in some sense to this word. Uh, but emet here means you're being dependable. So you're being faithful. So he says people don't trust each other because they're cheating each other. You can't depend on people's words. This is one of the problems in Israel. Now, you and I know that this is not just a Jewish problem. It's a world problem. And uh, yet, so there's huge immediate application of these things. But God's saying, sons of Israel, I have a legal case against the people who live in the land because they're not being faithful. They're unreliable. And then the next word he says is they're lacking chesed. And the Hebrew word for chesed means faithfulness to the covenant. So it can mean faithfulness to any agreement, a legal agreement. It can mean faithfulness to promises. But specifically he's talking about faithfulness to the scriptures and the requirements that the scriptures have. And when you look around at your culture, is there a problem of people not being honest and not following the word of God? Certainly, it's huge. We're not that different from Hosea chapter 4. But this is what God is speaking to the people here. And he says there's no knowledge of God in the land. People are not crying out, uh, worshiping, loving God with all their heart, mind, and strength. That was true of Israel in his day, and it's true in our day.
And then he begins to list a very sad list of uh, terrible things going on. He says there's swearing, deception, murder, stealing, adultery, employing Hamas or strong violence, bloodshed following bloodshed. Then it says, interestingly, that this affects the actual physical state of the land. The land cries out. Uh, my wife Rachel once wrote a song where there's a very powerful phrase in it um, talking about the fact that the blood atones for the sins of the land. People have talked about the blood of uh, uh, aborted babies crying out from the ground. There's an aspect where our sin can actually affect the productivity of the land. They're not disconnected. This is not a kind of a totally secular, neutral world. God says your sins even affect the, the green movement of your land. So it's not only a question of a political green movement, it's a question of the sins of the people of the land that God is saying here. And he says the land mourns in chapter 4, verse 3. Everyone who lives in it languishes along with the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky. Also the fish of the sea disappear. So he basically is saying, you've got riot in the street. People are not dependable. People are violating their oath to the country. They're violating their oath to God. Does it sound like what's going on in the world today? Very, very much so. Basically, the word for sin in Hebrew, one of the three or four words for sin, involves rebellion against authority. And of course, Rebellion against authority is so politically incorrect these days, but it's central to the understanding of the Bible, the prophets, the covenant that God made with Moses, and even the new covenant as well. Sometimes we think we get off cheap in the new covenant. It's even worse because it's not only what you do, it's what you think about what you're going to do. Of course, that's the heart of Mosaic covenant as well. As Yeshua pointed out in the Sermon on the Mount, it's not enough to say uh, to murder someone if you are already planning it and thinking it in your heart, you're just as guilty. And there's a lot of that going on today where people don't actually murder, but they think about it all the time. So he's saying here that the problems for Israel involve uh, not only the prophet in verse uh, 5 of chapter 4, but uh, all the leaders, the priests in verse 4, the kings. It's everywhere. It, it touches every part of the, of, the, of the society. And so basically he concludes with a, with a description which is very depressing. And sometimes uh, reading the prophets is depressing. That's why a lot of people prefer to read uh, Proverbs or, or Psalms because you stay away from some of these issues. But it, it turns up in Proverbs and Psalms too. But look what it says in chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being my priest. Israel being talked to as a priest. Priest of the nations goes to the book of Isaiah, uh, latter chapters there. Since you have forgotten the teaching of your God, I will also forget your children. So he's saying... <laughs> A friend of mine who's a, a lawyer for many years in Tennessee talks about something called black robe fever. And that's when a judge puts on the robe and thinks he's God. Well, this is different. This is God wearing the robe, and he is God. And he's saying, basically, this is what I'm planning to do. And so as we move into chapter 5, uh, we get uh, close to the issue of the... Um, of the uh, the verdict. So let's take a look at that in chapter 5. Uh, and verse 1 says, Hear this, O priests, and give heed, O house of Israel. Listen, O house of the king, for the judgment applies to you. And then he begins to explain. And again, to do this properly takes hours and hours to go verse by verse and to get into the Hebrew because some of it is incredible poetry He's making word plays and puns. He's referring to places in Israel. He'll call Beit El, 
Instead of Beit El, he'll call it Beit Avin. Instead of the house of God, he calls it the house of sin because of the calves there. There's a lot going on here. But uh, I want to focus right now uh, toward the end of chapter 5, if I may, with you. He talks about in verse um, 13 of chapter 5, he says uh, basically Ephraim, which is another name for the ten tribes of Israel, because Ephraim was a half-tribe. It was Joseph's kids, Ephraim and Manasseh. But Ephraim became so populous, this little half-tribe, that it was the biggest population of any tribe in all of Israel. And so they called Ephraim the biggest tribe for Israel or Israel. Today we call Washington instead of America uh, and uh, London instead of England. Well, Ephraim was called instead of the ten tribes of the north. And it says in verse 13, Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to King Yariv. This is another Yarev, another name for, uh, for the king of Assyria. Uh, but he is unable to heal you or to cure you of your wound. So Israel makes a treaty with Assyria and becomes a vassal to Assyria, hoping that it'll be delivered from other battles going on, including Egypt. But he says in verse 14, I, God, will be like a lion to Ephraim. So this verdict involves bringing judgment to uh, the ten tribes of Israel. And I will be like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear to pieces and go away. I will uh, carry away and there will be none to deliver. Verse 15, I will go away and return to my place. So this is quite uh, quite serious, this uh, discussion. God says, I'm not here to talk. I'm here to shoot. I'm here to basically rip you to pieces, Israel. My chosen people that I chose in order to be a light to the nations, I talked to them as a, as a bride. I, I, I saved them out of the desert. I clothed them. I gave them all this incredible revelation. I put my Holy Spirit in their city. I called tribes to serve me and other tribes to be king over all the world. I did these incredible things. And you're just blowing it all away and you're turning to demonized pagan cultures. And you've done it again and again and you've disappointed me again and again. I'm going to have to come with a rod of correction, and I'm going to be using Assyria. Isaiah calls Assyria the rod of my anger, and he says, I'm going to use that rod, and I'm going to tear you to pieces. And then he says here, there will be none to deliver. In verse 35 of chapter 5, I will go away and return to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face, and in their affliction they will earnestly seek me. So this is a really strong passage. He says, I, God, am moving away from Israel for right now. I'm going back to my place, which would be heaven, and I'm going to stay there d distinct and separate from Israel until Israel acknowledges their guilt. This is a national acknowledgement, and they seek my face in their affliction, b'tzar lehem, in their affliction, in the narrowness, they're going to earnestly seek me. So this is very heavy, and it's again, it's an axial point in Israel's history. Until we acknowledge our offense, God's not returning to us. What is that offense? So we're considering this offense that it says at the end of Hosea 5, why is God acting like a lion to tear at his chosen people? to send them into grievous exile. What, what's going on? What's the offense? You know, so many of us live in the present. And when we read the Bible, we also read it in the present. But the Bible is a book of history. In Israel, kids study the Bible. This is Jewish history. It's our history book. And we need to understand what's going on in Jewish history. Without that, we're just kind of stumbling over events, but there's no context for them. 
The context for this offense is very clear in the scriptures. Some of us don't know it, so let's look at it for a second. 1 Kings 12. Here's the background to the offense. 1 Kings 12. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, had a son who was a young punk, basically. He had a prophetic name, Rehoboam, or in Hebrew, Rehavam, which means expanding the people. And in his reign, because of what he did when he acceded to the crown, uh, he split the nation into two. Now, a lot of it had to do with Solomon's taxes. Solomon taxed the people, but in those days, the corvée or the mas was a taxation where you actually had to show up. And for six months, you had to leave your farm, your wife, your family, and go work cutting stone, building buildings, doing public works projects. And Solomon built these incredible things, but a lot of people were really angry because there was economic pressure and social injustice. That was another aspect. And of course, you know, Solomon toward uh, ma- making alliances with various countries ended up marrying the women, building temples for their demons to worship. So you had Yahweh's temples and then all these other demonic temples, and it became a stumbling for Israel, and it led to the uh, walls of distinction being broken down and demonic influences coming in, which which really blossomed in the north in the ten tribes of Israel. So when Rehoboam is about to become king, and they're gathering together towards Shechem or Nablus or Shechem, and uh, the young people and the old people suggest to him, and, and the older people, the wiser ones, say it's an election year. Uh, you're about to be crowned. Promise anything you want. Then do what you want. Promise anything, you know, they want, rather, and then you can do whatever you want. And the young people say, now you got to show that you're tough. Show them you made a, what you made of you, made of steel. And what happens is he goes after the young people's advice, and he says, you think my dad was tough? I'm going to be even tougher. And so what does it say here? It says in verse 13 of 1 Kings 12, the king answered the people harshly, for he forsook the advice of the elders, which they had given him. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men. And he said, my father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. Those are kind of whips with little pieces of metal in them that are like scorpions stings. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of events from Yahweh, that he might establish his word, which Yahweh had spoken through Achiah the Shiloni, to Jeroboam the son of Nevat. So there's a whole prophetic thing going on behind the scenes, the rest of the news. Today, there are similar things going on in our countries that most of us don't, don't know about. I'm not into conspiracy when I say this. I'm just saying this is the way it works in human history. Verse 16, 1 Kings 12, when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king and they said, what portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now look after your own house, O David. So Israel departed to their tents. Verse 19 says, so Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. That's that word again, Pesha. So Israel rebelled against the house of David. Of course, when Yeshua came, he also from the house of David, we rebelled against him as well. This is a national sin. And Hosea says in chapter 5 that God says he goes back to his place and puts separation between himself and the ten tribes of Israel because of this rebellion. This is a very heavy thing. And so the acknowledgement in, in, in Hosea 6 involves confessing that we have rebelled against God. So it says here in chapter 6, verse 1, Come, let's return to Yahweh, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. So let us know, let us press on to know Yahweh. His going forth, coming to us, is as certain as the dawn, and he will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. So this prayer here in uh, chapter 6 basically talks about uh, 
God coming to the Jewish people like the rain. And this prayer is a good prayer. It's basically confessing our sins. And God responds saying, you know, uh, you know, will I bring the rain? He says, one of the problems with you, Israel, is you make, you talk a good talk, but you don't always walk a good walk. And so if we look at uh, Hosea 6, 1 through 3, as this is the prayer that Israel will pray at the end of days to God, the acknowledgement of our sin, like Isaiah 53 is a national confession of the people in terms of returning and saying we rejected our Messiah, but he was bruised for us. So he says, okay, now let's get back to where you are today, Israel, in Hosea 6, 4, in his own day. And he says, your problem, what shall I do with you, Ephraim? What shall I do with you, Judah, north and south? Your loyalty, your chesed, your faithfulness, your sticking to what you repent about is like a morning cloud. You see the clouds here in the Jezreel Valley. It's like the dew which goes away early. Therefore, I have hewn them in pieces by the prophets and slain them by the words of my mouth. It's a very terrible uh, passage here. Um, and it goes back to what happened in 1 Samuel 15, when Samuel pulled out a sword and cut King Agag to pieces because of his trying to destroy the Jewish people. So he's saying, we still have an invasion coming. Again, remember that Jose wrote this about 40 years before the uh, Assyrians came in and destroyed Israel. That wasn't changing. One day this prayer will be said, but it's going to be said from exile. It's going to be said in the land of Israel as well. It's going to be said when we repent here. But he says, listen, you know, I wish that you would repent earlier rather than later. And he says at the end of chapter 6, Judah, there is a harvest appointed for you when I restore the fortunes of my people. So this is the harvest uh, that we would hope would be a good harvest. Certainly there's a harvest when God uh, judges, like it says in the, in the book of Joel, uh, chapter 3, that there's a harvest uh, is ripe, put the sickle in the wine press is full. But there's also a positive harvest in Jeremiah 30, uh, verse 3 and in Amos 9, 14. So uh, uh, God promises to bring a judgment harvest, but also eventually a salvation harvest to Israel. So Hosea 7 talks about Israel being a flaming oven, so hot that it burns itself up. It says, instead of being a light to the nations, it's taken the pollution spiritually of the nations and mixed it in with its uh, social patterns, its religious patterns. And he said, basically, I made you into a bow that you should shoot out arrows directly with clarity and hit the target. You've become, instead of a good bow, a warped bow. It's like a rifle with a bent barrel. You can't hit the target anymore because your own sin has clouded your perception. And so I'm going to send you into judgment in Egypt, he says at the end of chapter 7. Then in chapter 8, Hosea says to Israel, gather together like in Numbers 10 and sound the alarm on the ram's horn, on the shofar, because you violated the covenant and Assyria the eagle is coming. One of the images of Assyria was the eagle's wings. He's going to come and he's going to judge you. He says, what have you done? Well, one of the things you've done is you've taken uh, kings that you've established not by me. They're not from David. That's part of the rebellion issue. You've set up idle centers in, in Dan and in Bethel with golden calves there, and you've been worshiping the demonic powers behind them. This is a stone that they found um, talking about, uh, it was found in Tel Dan area, and it's in Greek, so it's Hellenistic times, maybe 300 B.C., 250 B.C. And it says, this plaque is in honor of the God who lives in Dan. Okay, These are non-Jews, Greeks, living in that area, Lebanese, probably Phoenician Lebanese, um, Canaanites, uh, 
And they're still remembering that there was a center of worship uh, there in Dan. God says, because of these types of things, um, I'm turning against you. And if, this is the actual place in Dan where uh, the worship was. So you would come into the uh, precinct of the temple here. This would be where the altar was, uh, where the beasts would be slain, the blood collected, and then brought up to these steps where that man's standing and brought into their Holy of Holies. So this was part of that. And it's actually, you can go and visit this in Israel. It's one of the, uh, we had a meeting once of um, young uh, Messianic believers there where we gathered at Hanukkah time. And we stood over outside there and we just said, Lord, would you forgive us for rebelling against the house of David, for setting up these false things? We prayed the very things that Hosea 6 says we're supposed to be praying. You know, you can be doing that in your country. You can be interceding for Israel to pray about these things. It's a really uh, hard challenge here. So in chapter 9 again, uh, there's so much description of sin, sometimes it gets depressing, but one of the things he says here in chapter 9 of verse 10, he says, you know, you don't expect to find grapes in the desert. He said, Israel, you're like grapes in the desert here. Anyone who ate from them kind of got sick. And here are grapes being grown just south of where we live in the Negev Desert right now. Uh, real grapes, and, and the wine is not so bad. Um, for those of you who do drink wine, if you don't drink wine, uh, the wine is terrible. Um, but uh, you can see these pictures uh, where it's actually happening again slowly. It's not the whole desert, but uh, this is the, the parallel here. And basically he says Israel is going to be wandering around the nations. And the word here is nodedim, noded, which means to wander like the Bedouin. If you're going to speak Arabic, Bedou means wanderer. So he says Israel is going to be wandering around the world in judgment because they didn't bring forth good fruit. And the fruit that they brought forward was kind of bad, like as much fruit as Israel gave, as many altars Israel had, it says in chapter 10, verse 1. So you're going out, you're going out uh, to exile. So a lot of very, very, very sad things. And God says here, what I'm looking for and which could have prevented it, he says here, Ziru lachem litzdaka, kitzru lifi chesed, niru lachem nir, vaet lidrosh et Yahweh, ad yavo viyoret sedek lachem. And in English it would say, sow for yourselves according to righteousness. In other words, invest in a lifestyle of righteousness. Harvest according to faithfulness, covenant faithfulness. Cut up a new furrow, plow a new furrow, or a furrow, because it's time to seek God's face so that he will come and rain righteousness upon you. This is the, the gospel invitation, the altar call, that Jose is giving in chapter 10, verse 12. Even in spite of all this judgment, he's saying, you know, even now you can return and it'll be, it'll, it won't be as bad. You know, it's a, it's a real challenge here. So now in um, Jose 11, beautiful passage because this is quoted in Matthew uh, chapter 2. It says, out of Egypt I've called him to be my son. Well, in chapter 11 of Hosea, God is recounting Israel's history. And he says, you know, when Israel was a child, a little child, I loved her and I called her out of Egypt to be my son. I called my son out of Egypt, I'm sorry. And um, so this is, of course, a very Arab-looking family in Egypt, but you get the picture that uh God says, you know, I have this love for the history of my people. We have a relationship. It goes back a long time. It goes back to Egypt. And when you were a child nationally, I called you to come and be mine. But he says, uh, you know, here's another. This is a, a Jewish guy with a couple of donkeys that aren't going too fast or too far. Uh, but it's also the concept of a desert. And, of course, in Matthew, uh, Matthew gives a prophetic word saying, like Israel was called out of Egypt, 
So the Messiah recapitulates or goes through Jewish history in his own life. He goes to Egypt. He comes out of Egypt like his people came out and comes back to the land. So it's not a direct, it's not a denial of the Exodus, and it's not saying it's unimportant. It's saying the Messiah echoes all the twists and turns of Jewish history here. And of course, that involved coming to Bethlehem and the Messiah being born in Bethlehem. Of course, after that, he went to Egypt, and after that, he came back to Nazareth just to keep the historical record straight. But he says, basically, I was like a doting father. My, I reached down, I gently helped you to dawdle, to walk, to learn how to walk. I fed you with a little spoon. I was so kind to you. I did all these wonderful things for you. And you didn't know it was me. And so you went running after all these other gods. And he says, I'm going to have to judge you. But my kishkas, my splankthoi, to use the Greek word, my innermost gut is turned upside down when I have to judge you. I don't want to do it. I love you. And he said, I'm not going to continue in verse 9 of chapter 11 to execute my fierce anger. I will not destroy Ephraim again, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. So yes, he comes and he roars. As a matter of fact, it says here, at the end of days, there's this passage which reminds us of Amos 3, 4 and 8. And he says in uh, Hosea 11, verse 10, they will walk after Yahweh, he's saying, when Israel comes back, he will roar like a lion. Indeed, he will roar and his sons will come trembling from the west and they will come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria and I will settle them in their houses, declares Yahweh. So he's saying at the end of days, Yahweh's going to roar and his roaring will bring the Jewish people back from the west, from the countries of the west, from the east, the countries even from uh, Japan, from China, from uh, uh, Iraq, uh, from all these different countries and bring us back to the land of Israel. And then he says here, I'm going to settle them in their houses, in their land. So this whole issue of God restoring the Jewish people, we are so privileged to live in the time when these things are happening here. It's like these are the things the prophets hoped to see, wanted to see, and a uh, very, very interesting time that we are in here. Okay, so as we move into chapter uh, 12, there's again going through the covenant that uh, Israel makes with Assyria. Uh, and then I just want to read something interesting here. It talks about in verse 2 of Hosea 12, Yahweh has a dispute that's a legal dispute with Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. Verse 3, in the womb, he, that's Jacob, took his brother by the heel. Now, we know this story. Jacob, the one who was holding on to the heel of Esau or Edom. And how many sermons I've heard saying, you know, Jacob the deceiver, Jacob the sneak. The sneak. I want to just touch on that for a minute here. Hosea 12, 3. In the womb, he took his brother by the heel and in his maturity, he contended with God. Yes, he wrestled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. So all of a sudden, God is saying, Jacob's life is a life of intercession, contending for the promises of God. Now, it's interesting, there was a prophetic word that uh, Jacob uh, was the one who was to be the chosen seed, not the uh, Edom Esau, but Jacob. And then when Edom sold, or Esau sold his birthright to Jacob, legally it was now not only a prophetic word, it was a done deal. So when Isaac came to bless Edom, to bless Esau, as the firstborn, Isaac was violating the prophetic word and violating the agreement between brothers. Isaac was cheating. And Esau was deceiving and willing to do that and receive it when it didn't belong to him anymore. How many sermons have you heard about that? But here in Hosea 12, God says, Jacob was contending 
for the promise, the prophetic promise of the Abrahamic covenant. That's huge. That changes the world. And he wanted that. And he didn't fully understand it, but he knew it was right and good. And so he wrestled with God. And the word for Israel, interestingly enough, comes from the word sar, to become a prince, to fight, to become a prince, to be victorious. So he's saying he wrestled with God and he was victorious. And uh, and then God's plans are victorious through him. And uh, so it's so interesting. So next time you hear somebody talking about Jacob as a deceiver, remember that the person who said that in, in Genesis 25 and 27, that was Esau. That was his declaration. And then Isaac said it too. But the fact of the matter is, it was they who were deceiving God because it had been twice sealed signed and delivered to Jacob himself. So here's this intercessory calling on the Jewish people, and Jacob is talking about that here. Beautiful passage in uh, um, Hosea 13, verse 4 through 9. It says, basically, um, there's a... um, no Savior beside me. There's no other one who's going to rescue you in uh, verse 4. I have been Yahweh your God since the land of Egypt, and you are not to know any other God except me, for there is no Savior beside me. Doesn't that reflect Isaiah 50, 45, verse uh, 21? Uh, At me every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. And also Acts 4.12, where Peter says, Yeshua, he's the only name. He's the only Savior. There's no other name given under heaven by which we may be saved. This is important. If you care for the Jewish people, this confession in Hosea 13, there is no salvation except through the Son of David. And so that's part of our message. It's not just looking at the the prophetic here. It's saying, okay, God, what are you doing with the prophetic? And that has to do with your promises upon Egypt here. Now, it says here in the, in this pa- passage here, I will be like a lion, 13.7, I will be like a lion to Israel, like a leopard. I will lie in wait by the wayside. I will encounter them like a bear robbed with her cubs. I will tear open their chests, and I will devour them like a lioness, as a wild beast would tear them. So he comes back to this image again of the Lion of Judah, having to do terrible things to his people through the exile. It's a really strong term here. So now let's end the book on a a more encouraging and helpful note in in chapter 14 here. Okay? I'm going to take a sip for a second because I've been talking for a long time. So in Hosea 14, there's a call that God gives to the Jewish people. And this call involves coming back and reversing the curse and returning the Jewish people to their land. Return, O Israel, to Yahweh your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you, words of repentance, right? And return to Yahweh and say to him, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously that we may present the fruit of our lips. Assyria will not save us. We will not ride again on horses, nor will we say again, our God, to the work of our own hands. For in you, the orphan will find mercy. Same word like the beginning of the book, rachamim, lo ruchama. And now Israel says, I'm not the source of my own mercy. You are. And so he talks about God returning the Jewish people and they will be blossoming in their own country. So this incredible statement of God returning the Jewish people, this is what he's doing. He's taking Jews from all over the world, and here is a list of Jews who've already begun to return. More Jews have returned since 19, late 80s to the land of Israel than came back in the books of Nehemiah and Ezra. We're living in incredible days right now of the Lord returning, where he's regathering the Jewish people from all these different lands. These are the prophecies dealing with that return that a Jewish artist, Messianic Jewish friend of ours, did years ago. It's a poster uh, that she did. 
And God says, basically, I'm going to bring you back. You're going to live in tents again uh, as I bring you back. Uh, but my presence will be with you. And this uh, incredible description here uh, of God uh, returning the Jewish people from all over the world, uh, living in tents, uh, and uh, basically then what happens at this point is he, he um, let, let me just move forward a little bit more. He says um, three times he uses the word Lebanon. And remember, Hiram, King Hiram, had a wonderful relationship with, uh, with Israel. Um, and he says, I will be like the dew to Israel, and he will blossom like the crocus. He will take root like the cedars of Lebanon. His shoots will spread. His beauty will be like the olive tree. These are pictures of Lebanon and the beauty of Lebanon and the cedars of Lebanon. His fragrance, in verse 6, will be like the cedars of Lebanon. And... Um, so it talks about um, the, um, the grain in Lebanon. They will blossom like the vine, and his renown will be like the, vine, like the wine of Lebanon. So these are pictures that Hosea would have had in his vision uh, uh, of what it would look like in those days, uh, the beauty uh, of Lebanon. These are all Lebanese pictures. And he says Israel is going to have such incredible... Um, um, flowering. It'll be like the crocus growing in Lebanon. This is actually uh, a picture of the crocus flower growing in Lebanon. And he says here, whoever is wise, let him understand these things. It's like the end of the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of Yahweh are right, and the righteous will walk in them, but transgressors will stumble in them. So God is calling Israel, he says, Remember that from me comes your fruit. Nevertheless, I will judge wickedness, but there's a much better way, and that is to rend your hearts and not your garments and come to him and repent for our rebellion against him and against the house of David, and especially for the Jewish people, to say, would you forgive us and restore us to our land so that we will be close to you. Once again, a renewal of our wedding vows with the God of Israel in the Valley of Jezreel, which will be where God sows compassion and mercy on us. And so, Father, in Yeshua's name, we ask that you would take these words and stir in us and cause us to remember the good things. Father, we ask that you would call us to intercede for your people because these are not just promises disconnected from a people in a land. They're very much connected to your people in your land. Help us to see the word accordingly and to pray accordingly and to work with activism accordingly. We ask that in Yeshua's name.